Okay, today we're going to work on a nostalgia still life. Nostalgia has to do with looking back at memories fondly, usually something from a long time ago, from your childhood, and when you think of these memories, it really makes you feel good and happy inside. And a lot of times, objects that we see give us feelings of nostalgia. They remind us of different times in our lives, and it makes us feel good. So we're going to be using um, candy, toys, any little item that you can think of that gives you that feeling of nostalgia. And we're going to try to draw it as realistically and accurately as we can using our contour lines, which is the outside lines and the line details, and really looking at some proportions, making sure things are in the right spot and where they should be. Now, I have chosen this dots box of gummy candies and I have it propped up on a pencil just so that you can see the angle a little bit better and a little bit closer to what I will be drawing and seeing. Um, if I put it flat on the table, you're not gonna see any of the sides and my drawing might not make very much sense. So what I'm gonna do is look at my box that I have here and I'm going to do my best to try to draw um, the angles and the different shapes that I'm seeing onto my paper so that you can see how we do this. All right, just a disclaimer, my angles that I'm drawing might look slightly different than the way you're viewing it. Again, because I'm looking at it from a different perspective than you are because of the angle of the camera. I'm gonna start by drawing the lines that I'm seeing here. And now I'm gonna try to draw the line that comes up this way. I recommend doing these drawings very lightly and also drawing it um, in sort of more of a sketch manner. So like this, we kind of might maybe go over the same line a couple times. Um, I'm drawing a little bit darker than I normally would only because I wanna make sure you can see it on view in the camera. So now I'm gonna start drawing these lines that look like they're coming down from the box and I'm gonna to try to connect them as well. Once you have the initial shape of your box, and remember if there's angles that look funny or they don't look quite right, you can fix them. This is just a rough draft, and when we do our final, we're gonna be looking a little bit more carefully at the perspective and the angles and really trying to make sure that we match them accurately in our drawing. But for now, I'm just going to kind of see how I can do with this particular object, see if it's challenging enough, not. Uh, too challenging if I need to switch my object or if I like what I've got. Um, that's what this time is all about. So I'm going to start with these big circles that have the letters for dots on it. And this is what you're going to do as you're drawing your details. You're going to be talking to yourself a lot. You're going to be asking yourself questions. For example, where is this circle S? It's in the upper corner. How close is it to this corner compared to this side? Or how far away is the distance to the bottom? So I would say that my S is probably somewhere in this area. So I'm gonna do kind of that sketchy drawing shape that I talked about. And I'm gonna put one there. I know that the last dot is in the lower corner on the other side. Um, it's close, but not as close as this one was. So I'm looking at the difference. I see there's more space here than there was here. There's a lot more space on that side than this side. So I know that I'm gonna to try to put my dot circle more in this area. Next question I have for myself is how close are these dots? Well, they're actually touching each other, one in front of each other, and there's two more in between. So now I have to draw two more, big enough that they all are touching and I see I have a big gap here. I also want them all to be the same size. I don't have different size circles here, so I've gotta really rework some of this, and this is where I'm gonna to have to go back and forth, look at what I'm seeing, and try my best to redraw and adjust for the inaccuracies that I'm seeing as I'm drawing. So I'm gonna keep playing around with this until I think I have the size about right, and once I'm satisfied with that, I will move on to some other things, like these gumdrops. So we have this first red one that's kind of hidden behind the S. So I'm gonna stick that right over here. I have this one that's tilted to the side and it's really right in between the T and the S. So right in between the T and the S here is where I'm gonna do it. The bottom of it is very close to the edge of the box. So I'm going to make sure I get close to the edge of the box when I draw this one. 
it's bigger than this one as well. So I'm making sure that this gumdrop looks bigger than the one behind it. So see, these are all the questions I'm talking to myself and asking myself as I draw this to make sure that I'm being accurate. I'm gonna add some of the other ones. This orange one is right under the T and it's being blocked by these other gumdrops. And this green one is between the O and the T and it's really right on the edge. So this would be the, where the O and T is. And so I'm going to make sure this last one gets down here somewhere. Again, I'm not too, too concerned if the shapes of all these gumdrops are perfect or anything right now. I'm just trying to get them in the right place. Um, I can also, I could have done this before, but I'm putting like my D, my O, my T, and my S just so I know exactly where they would go. And I can add some of these other things like the little wave that I see here at the bottom of this box and how it goes right into the green gumdrop. So I'm gonna make sure that I am doing that as well. There's some words down here. I can't really write the words. My sketch is too small, but I'll still get them in there. And you can see from your perspective, some of the DOTS and then the gumdrops in the end. I can see more of it from my perspective because of the way I'm drawing it. So I'm going to try to just sketch in where I think those circles would be how far they go. All four of the circles, the last circle ends underneath the green one. So again, I'm comparing, okay, the D is under the D, but the S gets under the green gumdrop. So I wanna make sure I'm spreading them out. The same amount of what I'm seeing here, I'm looking at perspective, I'm looking at um, proportions, I'm making sure that things are going in the right place, in the right direction as best as I can. And then on the side, if I can see anything, I would put like those items that I can see on the side as well. All right, once you have your shape done, the next thing to do is decide, was this something that I think I want to tackle on the bigger scale? Do I wanna use this for my final? Or is this something that I want to maybe trade in for a different object to try to come up with something maybe different that I feel either is more interesting for me to draw, easier or maybe more challenging, depending on what the object is that you're drawing. You might make some of those different choices. Okay, as soon as you're done with this, we're gonna move on to final copies. All right, before we transfer what we just did to our final paper, we're going to do uh, some work on our composition. Composition has to do with the arrangement of the elements um, on your paper, your canvas, whatever you're doing. So if you have more than one object, you have a lot of different options for composition. But if you have one object, you have to think of maybe a couple different things you could do with just that one object. How can you take that one object and make it a little bit more interesting? So we're gonna do something called thumbnail sketches. Thumbnail sketches are quick little drawings. They're not really refined and nice, they're just quick. So I would recommend doing at least three different ones just so you give yourself a variety of options. So on a piece of scrap paper, just draw yourself a few rectangular shapes. They do not have to be nice. This is definitely not nice. I did not use a ruler to do these. And you're going to, inside this space, this little sketch, you're going to pretend that this represents your whole paper. Now, if I was drawing this on my whole paper, what is one composition I could do? Well, one composition I could do is kind of what we did in our practice run, and that is I could have just the box and you can see how quickly and sloppy I'm making this. It's not really neat and nice. I'm just kind of doing a few random shapes to represent the box that I drew. And this could be one composition idea. An object right in the middle of the page, maybe slightly tilted, there you go. All right, let's think of another one. Something I could do to maybe make this more interesting is maybe open it up. And that could be a different look. So maybe I could even let some of the pieces come out. So if you have an object that you can crumple or that you can disassemble or something that you can remove items from, that could make a really interesting final piece. Now, if it is something that you can open and check, check out right away, great. If it's an object that belongs to somebody else and you don't wanna open it without asking first, then just imagine this step, but I am opening it up 
taking a few pieces out just so I can imagine what that might look like. Um, so I might have the tab that looks kind of like this. And again, I'm doing this really fast and maybe I would have a few of these gumdrops kind of spilling out and all over the place. So that's another potential option I could do. Another potential composition would be to maybe even crop my object. So instead of showing the entire um, shape of the object, like I did in both of these, maybe I could instead do something where I only show part of it. So maybe I don't have the whole thing, but maybe I have just part of it. And again, maybe I did this open package look um, so that some of it's cropped off so you can't see it all. Very often doing cropping in your artwork can look really interesting. And maybe I'll still have a few gumdrops sitting around. Maybe I even want to repeat the same object more than one time. If you have more than one object, you can just repeat it on your table or you can do what I'm doing, which is just rotating it and perhaps having it come out from a different perspective. So maybe I could have um, an object coming out from this perspective and I could have another open piece over here. Maybe you could have the back end of the box over here. So you can think of all sorts of different ways that you could arrange your design. And once you've looked at all of this, you can decide which composition is your favorite. So which arrangement do you think is the most interesting, the most fun to look at? And if you don't like any of them, do some more thumbnail sketches until you get an image that you like. I think I'm gonna go back with my original where I showed the um, object by itself tilted, but I think I'm going to have it so it's cropped off the edge of the page. So I'm gonna end up doing that one. Yeah. So at this point, since so this is my final, I'm still gonna redo this sketch just the same way I did it, but on a larger paper. But when I'm done with it, this time I'm going to go through and really refine it. I'm gonna use a ruler to make sure my lines are really straight. Uh, maybe stencils if I need something to be perfect shape. I will really look carefully at every single shape of every letter to make sure all the fonts are exact. I'm gonna do my absolute best to get this to look um, as close to the original as I possibly can. I'm also going to go as large as I can. So I'm gonna fly through this a little bit quickly so you can kind of see how it's coming together and notice how large I'm making it. Now that I have everything sketched back out again, similar to what I had over here, now is when I'm going to start going in and refining. That means making sure everything's sharp and clean and neat, using rulers, really looking at each individual object and each individual part of the design so that I can make sure that the S that I draw here looks exactly like the S that I'm seeing here so that it can be much more close to the original. Um, again, still not shading yet, but I'm going to go through everything and outline and try to just refine it.
All right, I have finished drawing my still life. I went through everything and tried to sharpen up all my lines and really check my proportions and everything. And although there could be still some things to uh, work on, we're gonna move on to the next step, which is adding the color. And for this, you're gonna wanna be really focusing on color matching. So really focusing on trying to match the tones and the colors that you see. Um, we are using color pencil, so the chances of getting an exact duplicate are not 100%, but we are gonna do our best to get as close as we possibly can. You're also gonna notice how colors on one side of the box appear to be a different color than the other side. So for example, the top of this yellow box is very bright. However, the side of the yellow is a good bit uh, darker and a little bit more dull looking. Um, and that's the same for all the other colors that are on the side. So the red, the blues, even the white are just a little bit more dull than the top of it. So when you are color matching, you also have to be thinking about that, about the differences in colors from one side to another. Just because the colors um, match on the top doesn't mean they're gonna match on the side and you're gonna have to make some adjustments. So let's get to it. When you're doing your colors, I do highly recommend having a scrap paper around or even the rough draft that you originally worked on to use as a sample before you actually do it on your final. Also make sure you're using some good quality pencils. The better quality your pencil, the easier it's gonna be for you to blend and layer colors and get a smooth finish. Um, Crayola is a great brand if you're just looking for generic pencils. It's, a, I think, a nice um, basic level color pencil. Um, you can do some good color layering with it. However, it's going to be somewhat limited. I think one of the best types of pencils, if you're trying to blend smoothly and nicely, would be Prismacolor. Um, it's a very well-known one. I, in particular, have these Prismacolor Scholar pencils. They are sort of the lower tier level of the Prismacolor. So there's regular Prismacolor, and then you can get Prismacolor Scholar, which is uh, cheaper, but I think still has a lot of the same qualities of the original Prismacolor. It still has really smooth pigments. It really blends well, so there's some good positives to it. All right, so when you're working with your color pencils, you wanna make sure that you're doing a good job of blending the colors together. Um, so I'm taking my yellow and I'm just gonna lay it down on my sample one that I had been working on before and trying to see if, when I compare it to the box, if it has the same quality or if it looks a little bit different. Um, I think that the tone of yellow is pretty close. I do think this has a bit of an orangey uh, aspect to it, so I think I might actually go on top of it slightly with a little touch of orange, just real lightly, um, in hopes to get a closer color match to the tone that I'm doing here. And you really wanna be careful about every little aspect of it. So if you're looking closely at the dots uh, logo here, you'll notice that the background behind the white letters is, um, of course, blue. But what you might not have noticed from a distance is that there's actually two shades of blue here. The top shade is a darker blue, and then there's this wave that go throughout the letters that's kind of a lighter shade underneath. So when I am coloring this, I'm going to be paying attention to the different tones, the lights and the darks. Um, there's also this orange halo around all of the letters. Um, I'm going to pay attention to that when I do my shading. Um, I've got these highlights over here that I need to make sure I add in. So there's lots of little details you have to be watching for and keeping track of. Um, I'm gonna just start coloring a little bit. I'm gonna do some sampling and then jump right into my final. And I will stop periodically just to discuss what I'm doing and how I got there. Um, but I'm gonna kind of fly through this.
whew, that was a long ride. <laughs> so we finally finished the top of our dot box. Um, that took quite a bit of time, but good things take time. Um, so what you'll notice that I did is um, I looked really carefully at every detail and every aspect that I could of my dot box. I was trying to be as observant as possible to notice the difference between um, the top of the background of the O versus the bottom of the background of the O. Looking at all of the little tiny lines, looking at the orange halos, looking at the little cast shadows at the bottom of my gumdrops, um, thinking about layering colors. None of these colors were made just by using one of those colors. Inside my red, I used some purples for shadows. I used a little blue um, in my green for shadows. I used a little purple again for my yellows for my shadows. Um, so I did a lot of laying, lots of very close observation in order to get my top to be as close to the original as I could. Now I'm going to be ready to move on to the sides. One thing that you should be observing as you're working with your objects is that just because one side of your object is one set of colors doesn't mean every side is that way as well. So looking at this dot box, uh, when you look at it carefully, you'll notice that the top of the box, the yellow from the top, is a much brighter yellow than the yellow on the side of the box. That is because of the shadows. The shadows that are naturally around every object are going to alter the way we view and see the colors. So when I'm doing my yellows, my yellow is not going to be the same exact color and tones, the same choices I made for the top won't always be the same choices as the side. Um, the white at the top is, I left the paper white because it was very crisp and white, but on the side here, this white is not a crisp clear white. It's almost a grayish effect. So when I'm doing these colors, I'm going to be very cognizant of that, thinking very, uh, being very aware of it so that when I am doing it, I make sure that I am coloring it appropriately um, so that I can get accurate color matching. All right, I'm going to keep going and we'll revisit at the very end when it's all done and we'll talk about cast shadows. everything in. I did my absolute best to try to match the tones um, as close as I could to the actual original tones of the box and I also tried to be very aware of the different um, shades of the same thing. So the top box is a much brighter yellow than the side. This side's the darkest. This side is sort of more medium tones and um, now I'm ready for my final step which is the cast shadows. So I'm looking at my box and this is a really good way to kind of do your cast shadow estimation is to put it on something that's very um, easy to see the shadows on. So I'm putting it on a white piece of paper so I can really see where the cast shadows are laying on my paper. And you can actually even take your pencil if it is a piece of paper and you could even take your pencil and sketch out where you see the shadows. Uh, let me zoom in so I can show you what I'm doing. All right, so here we have the box on a white piece of paper. Now remember, um, the angle that you're viewing it from is a downward angle. The reality is I'm seeing it more from this um, angle where I can see the sides. So um, I will be drawing the shadows in as I see them. They might look a little bit different to you because of the point of view that you are at. So I've got this laid down and what I'm going to do is look at where the shadows are. And this is again sort of a nice little like cheater way to get this done. Um, I'm going to look at where the shadows are being cast on the ground and I can even lightly outline where I think that those shadows would be. If this was a drawing, where would I start? the drawing of the shadow, where would I end it, and kind of draw some lines just to indicate to me 
where those shadows would be. You can even draw some lines to estimate where the different levels of darkness are. So the darkest part of every shadow is going to be directly underneath the object or right against the object. And then it'll gradually fade out into being a little bit lighter. Um, so you can even estimate, okay, until about here is where it's gonna be kind of like a me dark to medium. And then this is all gonna be really light out here. Um, so once you have that um, drawn out, you can use that and duplicate it onto your final. So I have my little um, shadow drawing done here and I can apply those markings to my final. Now my final is much larger. It's actually going off the page right in the area where a lot of the shadows are. Um, and that just means my shadows are gonna go off the page as well. So I'm gonna try to estimate on the side here where I think these um, shadows would be coming out of and for how far out it'll be. So I'm gonna kind of estimate to about here maybe is what, how much of the shadow I'll be filling in over here. And then I'm going to do the same on the other side, try to duplicate the angle that I'm seeing and try to draw that coming off of my object as well. And um, that means I'm gonna be filling in um, this section and this lower section with some shading to make it look like there's a cast shadow. Um, I'm going to use black for my shadow. I might add a second color into it just to warm it up because um, this is a mostly warm colored object. The base of it is that yellow, orangey, yellow, warm color. Um, and black is, tends to be a cooler tone, so I might add maybe a little brown or something just to make the shadow feel like it's connected more to the object. But here's how I'm going to approach this. I'm going to take my um, black and I'm going to press down hard against the edge of my object. Again, wherever the shadow is closest to the object should be where it's the darkest, right there on the edge. And then um, it's going to fade out. So I'm lessening my pressure. I'm trying to create more of a medium pressure and then I'm gonna fan it out to a very, very pale light pressure by the, I get to the very end. And I stopped about where I did my pencil line. That way I have a nice um, soft edge shadow. I don't want it to be really harsh. I don't want to color it in like a coloring book. It's not going to create a realistic shadow. So making sure I have a gradation of dark to light and um, that I'm leaving the edges a little bit fuzzy and loose. That tends to be a bit more realistic of what most shadows are. Some shadows do have sharp edges to them but the majority of shadows are going to have sort of a softer finish and again if I wanted to warm this up I can maybe take a little bit of brown or something which tends to be more in the warmer family and go over it as well with just sort of this lightly with this little brown tone that can kind of warm up my shadow so it feels like it belongs to my object a little bit better. Okay, and there we have our finished nostalgia inspired still life. Um, I hope you guys had fun making this and I hope you had fun learning a little bit more about shading, color layering, and working with proportions. And I absolutely cannot wait to see your finished results. Have fun.